Okay, welcome to tonight's midweek match day live. Um, tonight today we welcome uh, Stuart Carrington, who is author of the refereeing book Blowing the Whistle. Over to you, Stuart. Okay, thanks very much, Chris, and thanks everyone for attending. It's nice to speak to a few of you before we sort of start in earnest there. And, and obviously I've met, had the pleasure of meeting some of you before and certainly heard some names pop up and um, obviously everything I heard is true. Um, I'm, I'm really enthusiastic and pleased to talk to you about this subject today because as the slide in front of you says, I absolutely love psychology particularly sports psychology. Um, I first got interested in sports psychology. I was probably about 14 years old. And I remember hearing about a golfer. I'm not a big golf fan, but I hear, heard about this golfer who had a two foot putt to win a Masters. And he missed. And I remember thinking then, well, how, how does that happen? How does an elite sports performer miss a, you know, a, a, executing a skill that he or she should be so trained in that should be like a second nature and when I started to read up about it I started to read about things like clutching and clutching is where some psychological effect happens that might actually kind of impede the gross motor skills that uh, the performer does and actually as you research more into psychology we realize it's not just the gross motor skills that are affected so physical skills it's also the psychological skills and the psychological skills that are most affected when people are nervous or anxious are things like decision making and decision making. You see where I'm going with this is, is really important for officials across the board. Um, what I wanted to do was the more I learned and, and read about psychology, I wanted to apply it to sports officials and particularly officials in football, because football is, is my main passion and main love. What I wanted to do was think trying to find an example of a case where people could do some sort of exercise with psychology just to kind of reaffirm this importance of psych psychology and what i'd like you to do is i'd like you to do a very small exercise for me and this exercise uh, is from sir clive woodward's book winning and when uh, sir clive took over the england rugby team one of the things that he wanted to do was to show them that you can have all the physical skills you can have all the preparation and you can have all the training and all the talent, but if you lack the psychological awareness to apply those things at the right time, you're only gonna go so far. And it's really interesting because this week I've had the privilege to speak to some very high level UEFA referees and they've said exactly the same thing, that talent will get you so far, but you've got to know when to use that talent. Um, what I'd like you to do is to see, as you can see on the slide ahead of you there, it says count the Fs, really simple activity, is just have a look at this uh, passage, this sentence that I'm gonna bring up now, and I want you to count how many letter Fs you see. Okay, really simple. This is a couple of lines long, really simple. Count the Fs. In another couple of seconds, I'm sure you know, that's longer, isn't it, than you get to make a decision on match day. So let's go previous. Um, what I'd like to do is just call out, I know everyone's gonna be shy and no, no one wants to speak over each other. Could you just call out uh, how many Fs you counted? Two. 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 Three and two. Two. That's living on the other side of the world. Six. Three. Oh, oh. Ooh, someone got a six there. I'll bring this back up to large. Oh, someone else got a six. Someone got a three. Anyone get a four? No, I got two. Three plus one. Okay. Anyone get a five? Okay, so those, and I apologize, as you can see my screen, I can't see uh, who, who was answering there. Those of you that said two, three, and if anyone did get four or five, all I want you to do is I want you to count the ofs, so that uh, word of, uh, have a look. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I hear a few like ahs oh, then, it's, it's common. So first of all, those who got six, well yeah. done. Um, you're in a really, really small group. You're in about 2% group that gets six the first time you do that. If you've got two or three, please don't feel, oh, what? how do I mess that up, okay? It's actually a compliment. What it means is you're so good at reading and you're so well equipped and understand the English language at such a level, you don't need to look at those words on. You still understood what it meant. So you bypassed it. When you bypass information like that, it's called heuristics, and heuristics occur when you take in information and you can pick and choose, essentially cherry pick, things to look at and things where not to look at. And that's really effective in everyday life, such as reading. You don't really need to see those words of there. 
when, where my how harm you is when you're a referee. Because if you start to ignore vital cues, because you're starting to focus on one thing over another, that's where this application lies. A bit later on, when we talk about attention, I'm going to give you a really nice, practical, high level example of that. And it brings me on to the book. So the book, Blowing the Whistle, The Psychology of Football Refereeing. It was an absolute pleasure to write this, if we're not slightly painstaking. It took about two years, start to finish. And what I wanted to do was I wanted to make a book that was accessible, meticulously researched, and also applicable to referees all up the ladder. So from level seven, all the way up to select group referees. Um, and I really hope that I managed to achieve that goal. Um, the first question that I always get is why referees? And also there's sort of this add on question to that is and why referee? I think it says a lot about our culture that when you say to people, I am really interested in football referees and I, I, want, I wrote a book about it. People say, why? That says a lot about how we treat and approach referees in this country. And that, and that attitude is shared worldwide, by the way. There are one in three people who can influence the game. Um, there are three teams that compete every time a football match happens. It's just that only one of those teams, the officials, don't care for the result. Okay, They want the right result to occur, and they don't want to influence the result too much, but they can influence that result. And yet so little is done in academics or coaching. My background is sports coaching, and I'm very well versed in searching for journal articles on how to improve performance and skill acquisition and how to improve coaching communication. If I was to go onto my university database and search, you know, sports performance players or coach, I get about 750,000 hits. So about 750,000 journal articles have been written, accepted and published on sports performance regarding players and coaches. If I change that word at the end, take out players, coaches and insert the word officials, I get 70,000. So it's about 10% of the academic work is done on someone that is a third importance regarding the outcome of a football match. And I, I find that astonishing. Referees are much maligned and misunderstood. And the reason I know they're much mis maligned and misunderstood is because I was one of those people that shouted at referees when I was a coach, that shouted at referees when I was a player, that as a fan in the stands, I would have the same criticisms of referees week in, week out. Um, I didn't understand why referees did certain things. And I asked many questions and I'll come on to that. And what I also found was watching football in different countries or speaking to people in different countries is that this is a universal attitude. And, and I wanted to know why that was. Here are some of the questions that I've certainly said, fans have said to me, questions that I get having written the book. How has the ref not seen that? How many do they get ref? I've lost count the amount of times I've said that. Um, the ref is so arrogant. Um, this is one that now, having researched the book, really bothers me. Um, I saw a lot of stuff on Twitter this week about uh, John Mossy's boots and uh, you know, Mossy written on his boots and, and a lot of comments about that. I've, I've certainly got some opinions uh, upon that um, that I do approach in the book. And he or she doesn't know what they're doing. That one really frustrates me, particularly as I'm now better educated in the process that people undertake to become a referee. Um, one thing that I always do tell, ask people or sort of like relate to people when they say, why referees? I say, well, why do you think people referee? And the reason I ask the question is, is when you do some psychological research or you engage with psychological research, there's always two or three or five possible answers or possible reasons why something might happen. And in the book, I talk about all these reasons that might explain one consequence or one influence. One thing, that I always say to people is the, reason, the one sort of constant answer that you can give regarding sports psychology when you're asked why do people referee is because they love the game. A hundred percent, a hundred percent of referees that are asked, why do you referee? The answer comes back inevitably because I love the game. I want to be involved in the game. I really enjoy it. It's certainly one of the reasons why I took up refereeing. I feel like I belong in the game. I feel fit. I feel like I can do the movements I enjoyed when I played football. And I feel that I'm still part of, of the game that we all love. And of course, we need referees to play the game. This is really important. We know that one of the reasons that intrinsic motivation is important is that if you have it, you're more likely to persist. You're less likely to drop out. You're more likely to strategize, think about it in your own time. And you're also more likely to put effort in. These are really important skills for any sports person. 
And as we're going to find out, the referee is a sports person that is also a role specific skill. When I think about refereeing, I'm often tempted to relate them uh, to an arbiter. And when I first started writing the book, what I wanted to do was think, are there any other areas where there's psychological research to do with judging and decision making? And yes, there is. There's many, many psychological articles written about this gentleman in front of us here, the, the, the judge in the court of law. They have very similar pressures to a football referee. For example, they're presented with evidence. They have to consider that evidence. They're guided in that consideration by a law book. They then have to interpret that information, reference it to the law book and come up with a decision. They're subject to some influences. For example, you might have a very slick talking lawyer, shiny shoes, that's very convincing in their argument. They're also subject to some psychological phenomenon. One such phenomenon is the primacy recency effect. The primacy recency effect states that if you're well versed in what you're doing, i.e. like a judge would be, the thing that you hear first is the thing that you're most likely to remember in an argument. Likewise, if you're not well versed, so someone like me that doesn't know anything about law, you're more likely to remember the thing you heard last. It's why juries, if it goes to a jury case, they hear the defence last, so it's harder to prosecute. You have to be really convinced of someone's guilt. However, there are obviously some key differences between the gentlemen in front of us and the men and women that referee every weekend. The main difference, of course, being that this person can go away into another room in peace and quiet, seek counsel from others and take their time and deliberate over decisions. One of the things I wanted to start off with is break down this refereeing game in numbers. Um, again, like I asked you with counting the Fs, could, and, and I know that some of you have read the book and I'm grateful for that. Um, how many decisions do you think a football referee makes over a 90 minute period on average? Please just shout them out. Seven, 700. 700. 200. Anyone else want to take a guess? They're good guesses. I'll give you a clue. It's somewhere in between. Gosh. 350. Oh, who said that? Who said 350? Daisy. Daisy, right. Good. good um, mass, um, half of 700. There you go. Very good. Yeah, you're <laughs> just spot on. Well, I say you're spot on. Obviously, it changes. But um, yeah, on average, a, a football referee will make approximately 350 decisions in a 90 minute period. Now, in lab conditions, so, you know, as a scientist, when you do some research or you do an experiment, you do it under lab conditions, you can only include decisions. And what I mean by that is that's not including non decisions. So that time where you thought, oh, there might have been a little shirt pull there, but maybe it was six, one, half dozen, ever, and no one's complaining, let's just play on. That's called a non-decision. That's still a decision because you have decided to not stop the play. But we know there are about 350 decisions per game. Out of those 350 decisions, only about 50 are objective. So the ball crossed the line or it didn't. It came off the player in blue or the player in red. Um, you know, it's full time, you know, it's 45 minutes as a lap, something like that. These are objective decisions. That means there's about 300 subjective decisions every time you step onto a football pitch. Every time you go and put on that black top, you're going to make about 300 sub totally subjective decisions. And we know there are lots of influences on that. I mean, the most obvious one is positioning. Where were you when you saw something? We know that if we turn someone around, they might think something else. There are other influences that I want to talk about. But there's a very important statistic that follows on from that 300. This statistic is that there's no temporal bias in a game of football. What this means is you're just as likely to have five decisions in a one minute period as you are over a five minute period. You may do nothing for six minutes and then have a glut of decisions to make. You may have an incident that involves you or requires you to make three or four decisions at once. To break it down, if it was even, you'd make a decision on average every 12 seconds. Let's think back to our judge and think how they would cope having to do that whilst under extreme pressure and having to face many influences. And it's influences that I'd like to talk about. 
one of the questions that I get asked is how, uh, how much homework should a referee do? And should they do their homework? By homework, what I mean is should they research the teams that they're going to officiate or not? The jury's a little bit out on this one, and there's lots of sort of discrepancy here. We know that referees in uh, Latin countries, Spain, Italy, etc., Portugal, they tend to do a lot of homework. And that homework really relates to not only the technical and tactical preparation of the team, i.e. do they play out from the back, does the full back like to play long diagonal balls, are they direct, do they like to keep possession in their final third, etc., etc., but it also involves doing homework on how many yellow cards does this team have? How many red cards has this team had? Which players are known for simulation and which players are known for honesty? Which players are known for being quite aggressive? They talk to colleagues and say, is there anyone I need to get in the book early? We know that English referees tend to shy away from this a little bit. They do tend to look at a lot of technical and tactical, but not so much of the reputation. So which way is right? If we look at this fantastic study by researchers Jones, Paul and Erskine uh, in tw uh, 2002, we can see that this bar graph in front of us and there's two coloured bars on each category. There's a dark grey and a light grey. The dark grey was a group of referees that were told about the reputation of a team and that reputation was that they are particularly aggressive. The light grey shows the group of referees that watched a game and and they weren't told anything about the teams. They were just asked to watch a game of football and judge it. Let's look at the light gray bars first. Both bar one here and bar two here, they're almost identical. This means that the non or the impartial referees, I should say, they judged both teams in this particular game of football to commit more or less the same amount of fouls. And they also showed approximately the same number of cards. As soon as we look at the dark grey, this is the team that was told about the aggressive reputation. So the team of referees that were told about the aggressive reputation of a particular team. And you can see a noticeable difference. First of all, the aggressive team foul, so the team they were told were aggressive, the amount of fouls they committed not only doubled, but the amount of cards that they were shown almost doubled as well. So essentially they were penalised more often, and then when they were penalised, they were penalised with more severity. Interviews of referees show that they do this because they feel I need to control that The way I can control aggression is by showing. Now, I'm not here to say that's right or wrong. Everybody in this room is a better referee than me. You're all more qualified and you all have more experience. What I'm here to do is maybe show you that knowing about the aggressive reputation of a team or individual players doesn't always help. Having spoken to some referees recently, and particularly high level referees, one of the key uh, points or interesting facts that they gave me when I was sharing this was sometimes this is true but sometimes it can work in your favour so for example one Premier League official told me that if you understand that a player is maybe one yellow card away from a booking uh, from a suspension then you could maybe use that to control their behaviour i.e nothing silly today because you don't want to miss the big game next week and that might help referees with game management and controlling players. However, generally, it seems like it's not necessarily a good idea to know too much about the aggressive reputation of teams and keep your preparation down to a technical and tactical level. The importance of attention was highlighted in the little activity, count the Fs at the beginning. There are four types of attention that psychologists recognise. The first is broad external. This comes in your assessment when you go and do your pre-match, when you go and look at the conditions of the pitch, you might want to look at height of players. You might want to look at how many substitutes a player has. All these things, that's called a broad external type of assessment and attention. This is where you're trying to take in as much information as possible from as many different sources as possible. It's like taking a step back and opening your eyes. We, we can assess and then we can analyse. We might go down to the bottom left here, broad internal. So this is where you're thinking about many, many things, but you're only focusing on yourself. So you're not focusing about the conditions anymore. You're talking about your planning for the game. How much sleep do you think you're going to need? When do you think you need to leave to get to the venue on time? What are you going to do when you get there? How are you going to greet the managers and coaches and players? What sort of body language do you think you're going to have? What language are you going to use? Once you've done that, you might go to an external narrow in the top right. 
This is probably what most people think concentration looks like. This is where you're focusing on one thing. For example, a fast winger taking on their fullback and you're trying to watch them make a tackle or not, or not make a tackle or dribble or not dribble. And you're focusing on those two things, those two players, or maybe just the ball. What you're not noticing is all the movements going on behind you or to the left or to the right. You might not even hear calls or appeals at this point because you're so focused. And the final thing is preparation in terms of narrow and internal. And this is preparation that's going on during the game. For example, you might have just made a big decision. You may have just shown a red card, given a penalty, both. This is where you might self-talk to yourself. You might tell yourself to calm down. You might feel nervous. You might tell yourself to take a deep breath. So you're focusing everything on yourself and on one thing, maybe your levels of anxiety or nervousness at that particular time. A good referee is able to go from one to the other and back again very quickly. You need to know when to go from broad external to external narrow to narrow internal, et cetera, et cetera, very, very quickly. Two practical examples of this, one from a playing perspective and one from a referee perspective. Gareth Southgate, before he took his penalty in the Euro uh, 96 semi-final against, West, uh, against Germany, he stated that as he was walking to the penalty area and to collect the ball, he said he couldn't really remember much of what he was thinking about until the German goalkeeper, Andreas Kopka, smashed the ball against his own crossbar, sending it back over the goalkeeper's head to stop. And Gareth Southgate, in this interview, said, all I could think about was, how's he done that? Like, he smashed that ball really hard, deliberately against the crossbar from, like, 12 yards out, so it bounced to me, rather than just giving me the ball. That's a really good example of someone going from broad external, i.e. thinking about everything, to external narrow, only thinking about one thing. A question I always get asked is, is stress good for performance? All the evidence suggest yeah stress is good for performance if you're an expert and the reason being is the more stressed we get the more anxious we get we tend to focus on one thing we tend to focus on minutiae very very quickly if you know what you're looking for that's really good if you don't know what you're looking for that ain't so good I spoke to one referee who said he was actually taken off games and the reason he was taken off these games is because he kept missing penalties and when they reviewed and had a discussion about why he was missing these penalties he told him what he was looking at and he said what he would do is he would note he would look at the attacker's legs so when the attacker was running into the box dribbling the box he would only look at the attacker's legs thinking well i'll see any contact his attention was so narrow he was only looking at one part of the information he needed essentially he was missing the word of he thought that his strength was concentration it's possible his concentration was good almost too good and there's a big difference between concentration and the right type of attention. The final question I get asked about this is, well, how do you change that? And it's this one here, narrow internal. Take a deep breath. Tell yourself to take a deep breath while you're playing. Relax, self-talk, stay calm, keep up with play. Break the game up into five, 10 minute slots. I spoke to a rugby official in the week. He told me he writes the word reset on the inside of his left hand before every game. He says every time, he looks at his clock and five minutes has gone past. He looks, turns his hand over, reset. Forget everything that's gone on before. Just take a moment, focus, then back in the game. The final inference that I'd like to talk about, and the book's full of them, by the way, it was kind of like the meat and veg, if you like, the, the, what I really wanted to do when I first started writing the book is about crowd noise. So we know that football is incredibly pop popular and we know that the crowd likes to make a lot of noise. And if we're lucky in our refereeing careers, we, we get to officiate in crowds where there's a lot of crowd noise, like in the picture you see ahead of you of the new camp there. What we know is that crowd noise does impact referees and does so in two ways. We know that influences opportunity, i.e. how much time is played. And we also know that influences discipline. If I talk a little bit more about the discipline side, we know that the, uh, the home team is shown to a big, this home team will be given more free kicks than the away team. Not only that, the away team are penalised more severely. There hasn't been one season of the Premier League where, on average, the away team have had more yellow cards. Sorry, the home team has had more yellow cards over a course of a season than away teams. Hasn't happened. One of the significant factors they can only be attributed down to crowd noise. But we know that the crowd noise has certain caveats or mediators. 
we know that the crowd needs to be full. It needs to be a sellout. So the density of the crowd is significant. We also know that the proximity of the crowd is important, i.e. how close it is to the crowd are to the, to the football pitch. And we also know that the volume of the crowd is really important as well. So these three things have this massive, massive effect that will certainly influence a referee's decision making in those two ways, opportunity and discipline. A referee does not go out to favour one team over the other. And every referee I've spoken to will sort of testify to that. It doesn't happen. These are very slight, subtle cues. Like I said, I've been really privileged to speak to some high level officials over the last couple of weeks. One of them said, when it's a clear decision, crowd it doesn't matter. On those 50-50 decisions, crowd noise can affect you because you look for cues in everything you do. It can influence how you do things by instinct and it can influence by you overthinking. His words, a referee cannot think. We know that the noise and background atmosphere of sporting venues and sporting competition can influence subjective judges. And we know that this isn't limited to football. A fantastic study I talk about in the book looks at ice skaters. Ice skating judges are experts. They know the difference between a double axle and a triple axle and how to look for cues and, and, and pick up when people are jumping and if it's in time with the music and everything like that. We know that in experiments, if you show people an ice dance routine and you play no music, they give an X score. We then know if you show those judges the same routine, danced by the same performers, but in different outfits and with music, they give it a lower score, unless that music is perfect. I call crowd noise bolero for referees. It might not make all the difference. You still have to be an exceptional talent to be able to watch ice dancers and to perform the ice dance. All it can do is it can sway that 9.5 to a 10. The second part of the book moves on to sociological and historical influences of football referees. The reason I wanted to do this was purely because I can't get away from two things. One, a sociologist that I work with uh, who takes great pride in telling me this says, psychologists are just frustrated sociologists do. And the reason for that is the second thing and that psychology does not exist in a vacuum. We are limited by our society and our historical constraints. In some nations, and I certainly talk about this in the book, it seems to be harder to officiate than in some other ones. In Spain, for example, whenever a referee is uh, appointed to a game, the first thing that the newspapers will do at the, on the side of the column and the newspaper in the preview for the games is they'll say the referee for this game is x here's how many times he or she has officiated these teams and here's a list of the errors they've made doing those teams in italy they go one further not only do they say here's the list of errors they've made against those teams they put comments this is what the manager said about them last time they also show you how many reds and yellow cards they've shown that season what the players can expect essentially the referee's part of the game and they're game themselves. They're there to be abused. They're there to be shouted at. They're there to be distrusted. There are certain historical influences on this. I wanted to focus more, maybe speaking now about historically in Britain. So the game football has evolved from public schools. So upper class students would play football and they believed that they didn't need a referee because a gentleman would never deliberately cheat or did, uh, wouldn't ever deliberately try to uh, con someone. Uh, or fade injury into getting a decision. That started to change slightly. So they appointed captains. That's why we have captains now. It seems in football, we don't really need a captain so much, but the reason we have them is just tradition. We're bound by that. And it's so if there was a dispute over a certain decision, the captains would get together and say, yep, that was a foul or that wasn't a foul. And as football became professionalized in the late 1800s, it was seen as, well, you can't trust them anymore because there's a financial benefit. And we see that across culture. We know that in Argentinian football, in Italian football, in Spanish football, as soon as the game becomes professionalised, we know that people will start to become more distrusting of each other. And so you need to have an independent referee. At first, the referee just stood on the side, and then it was someone that had to be on the field. But the difference was, is when the game became professionalised, particularly in the north of the country, the players were very working class, and the referees needed to understand the laws of the game. 
they had to be so well trained and well versed in these laws they had to have come from the public school boys like harrow and eton and things like that so it became a class dispute who are you to tell me what to do you're like a headmaster i'm a grown man stop telling me how to play the game the reason I find this so important is for a few reasons. And the main reason is because we know that they massively impact recruitment, retention, and the mental well being of officials. An official I spoke to this week said that in his country, he knows that the way that the media impact referees is one of the biggest things that is harming retention. How does the media impact referees? Well, it's not just uh, you know, social media and it's not just newspapers, it's not just the news and Sky News doing ref watch and things like that. It's the way they're portrayed in popular culture, as hopefully this video will work and you'll see. I've got you. I'm not sure if you heard that because I did test this out with Chris earlier on certain videos. Did it, it was that? Could you watch that or did it not come up at all? So we could watch it and see it. But we didn't actually hear anything. Oh, <laughs> brilliant! Oh, do you know why? I don't think. You have that the sound. Put, yeah, that's why. Brilliant. Um, what am I? Oh, I don't want to stop sharing. What a shame. I'll, I'll fill you in, but I'm not going to do the voices, I'm afraid. Uh, Lisa asks Homer what she should do when she feels angry. And Homer says, you need to do what daddy does. You need to push all that rage down into a tiny little ball and then release it at an appropriate time. Like that time I hit that referee with the whiskey bottle. And Lisa's like, yeah. For me, what this really shows really perfectly is when we, we watch that cartoon and when people around the world watch a cartoon that's a cheap laugh but no one thinks about the underlying like, permutation of that encouraging violence encouraging abuse that these people are there to be shouted at one premier league referee stated in an interview not for me um but one that was published uh, elsewhere that he took his daughter to a game and like a local you know, sunday league game and everyone started shouting at the referee and when she said why they were shouting at that person, he said, because that's what you do at the football. And he sort of stepped back and thought, why am I telling like a 10 year old that this is just what you do when I'm a referee and this is what I'm doing? And do I want to try to encourage or permeate this attitude? What I wanted to do in the second part of the book is highlight that and go through all the reasons why this might happen and also look at solutions about how it might be fixed. In the final part of the book, oh, we, don't need, uh, we don't need Homer, oh, sorry, for my benefit, Homer and uh, Lisa were talking again. The good news is that we know that players and referees are very good at what they do. Referees are better at officiating football matches than players. So another, like, I was going to say show of hands, but we can call it out. In one study, they took 100 Bundes, professional German Bundesliga players and they showed them clips from the Bundesliga and they asked them to evaluate or rank these incidents. Would you give a foul? If so, which way? Would you show a yellow card? Would you show a red card? And they had a panel of referee experts to sort of say this is what we think the correct decision is. Percentage of decisions players got right on average. How many, uh, what percentage of decisions do you think the players got right on average? Let's hear it. Seventy percent. Seventy percent. Any any advance? Thirty. Thirty. Okay. Forty. Forty was that? Yeah. Okay. Forty. Oh, thirty-five. Okay. Fifty-five. Yeah, fifty-five is the closest. So on average, players get about fifty percent of decisions right. These are professional players. You know when you're refereeing, has anyone here ever heard, oh, you've never played the game ref? Yeah. Okay. These are players that not only play the game, they're paid vast amount of money to play this game. 
they do it every week twice a week and they've done it all their lives it's literally their livelihood when you ask those people to make decisions they get one in two right has anyone here ever been told you don't know what you're doing yeah okay imagine what you would have heard if every decision you make in every game you only get one out of two right every other one is wrong do you think you'd hear that a lot more yeah yeah because I, I know you'd get more than 50 percent right and we know that because referees do better i'll give the game away referees get about 80 percent right obviously you know th th there is an element of subjectivity there but agree it was agreed that the referees got 80 percent of decisions correct so we know that they've very vastly very significantly outperformed the players the reason this is important is because it reinforces that refereeing is a role specific skill any role specific skill needs something to improve and that is practice the difficulty or complexity here is that up until now and it's very recent the practice that referees have is physical go for a run work on your sprints it's kind of it maybe brush up on the laws of the game what i wanted to introduce in the final part of the book is this uh, psychological skills training model this model was originally uh, devised by an excellent researcher called roy samuel at the university of uh, tel aviv in israel i spoke to roy and he very graciously said by all means take this model adapt it modify it do what you want to do and i did that and the reason i modified it and, and this is what you're seeing on the screen ahead of you now is that i wanted to apply it to all referees whereas samuel's model was specifically for elite level referees it didn't take into consideration some of the research i did that would affect referees at level seven six five etc before i talk about this model i want to talk about the importance of psychological skills training we know that rugby league officials when asked to rank their top 10 skills needed to be a good official the top six, not only six in the top 10, the top six are exclusively psychological. We know that there is no psychological support training or support for referees in English football outside the elite group. All the referees I interviewed for this book at level seven, level six, level five, they said they weren't even mentioned. They weren't told anything. I interviewed an official last week and he told me if he could change one thing it would be more psychological training during his development stage as an official and he said the reason for that is two things one he said it would have affected his performance it also would have affected his well-being and importantly as well he thinks that they his sport is a rugby official have lost many many good officials because of it because they've quit because at the time they weren't robust enough but we know that robustness and resilience is something that comes of age and experience. So the people at the top that are getting the support, and I'm not saying they shouldn't, are the ones that actually might need it the least. However, we do know that PSC psychological skills training is the fastest growing area for referee development. There has been a big clutch of uh, academic research and support in this area recently. If we look at the model that I adapted from Roy Samuel, I, I'm obviously I'm not going to go through every aspect of it now, but I know that time is pressing. What I'd like to do is just talk about a couple of really key points that have been echoed to me. It's really significant, and they might not seem significant, but they're very, very important. And I also want to stress that this isn't just coming from level sevens and level six referees. I've spoke, I've, in this very week, I've spoken to premiership rugby referees, and I've spoken to UEFA standard referees. And they've all said the same thing about some of these points. Allocation of match and referee crew. As soon as you're allocated a match, talk to your assistants if you have them. How are you going to get there? How are you, how are you going to act? What's your demeanour going to be? What's your body language going to be? How are you going to greet people there? In your experience, what's the best way of going about that? If you don't have assistants, think about that on your own. If you do, have assistance think about how you're going to communicate in the game what sort of advice do you want if you're the referee if you're the assistant how do you want me to give you advice do you want me to insist do you want me to assist would you rather it was by body language first do you want me to do we have microphones can we communicate how are we going to communicate 
really, really important. The approach of a business like referee was ranked as one of the most important preparational parts of psychological training. Another aspect here is the planning, physiological, technical, tactical, and mental. What do you get? Let's look at the mental side of this here. How are you going to plan for this game psychologically? This comes not just immediately before the game, but days before the game. How much preparation are you going to do? What type of preparation are you going to do? During the game, what are you going to do to, your, like, to yourself psychologically? How do you, what mindset or mind frame do you need to be in to officiate well? What's gone well previously? What well, hasn't gone well previously? The performance box. How are you going to intervene with yourself? Are you going to write reset on your hand? How are you going to try to defer attention from a narrow internal to a narrow external? When are you going to start looking at yourself? When are you going to start looking at others? Are you going to use self-talk? What are you going to do when that gobby player starts shouting at you after 10 minutes? How are you going to handle that situation? Do you have like go-to phrases, stock phrases, something that referees really live by? Are you going to try and learn player names quickly? Are you going to brief people? And finally, the post-match analysis and assessment, a really key finding I'm getting out of my current research at the moment is that the feeling that officials get immediately after the game is when they feel most down, particularly if they feel they've made a mistake. Who are you going to surround yourself with at that time? Who are you going to talk to? What are you going to avoid? How are you going to review your performance? I think engagement in, with other people is very, very important not just after the game, but before the game. Many lef uh, level, uh, sorry, many referee trainers that I spoke to at all levels said, the one thing they encourage people to do is to watch other referees in their own peer group or one level above. So yes, you might get something from watching people like Michael Oliver and, and uh, Jonathan Moss, et cetera, et cetera. But you'll actually learn just as much from watching people in your own peer group or maybe one level above and looking at what they do, learning vicariously through them and understanding and speaking to them and saying, how do you handle this situation? How do you handle that situation? All these things lead to improved confidence and improved feeling of success. Also a better emotional state, which improves self-efficacy and confidence, which will always improve performance. I'd like to finish just by opening up these chapters for you and, and showing that the book is split, uh, split into three parts. We look at the influences on a referee, we look at individual differences and we look at psychological training. And I break down some of the subsections in there. Uh, Chris is probably looking at going, well, you've got about five minutes over there, Stu, so apologies for that, Chris. Um, but I'm eager to get on to any questions if anybody has them. Thank you very much for listening. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thanks, Stuart. So if anybody does want to come in with anything, anything for you, then uh, please do. Uh, yes, it's Richard Matthews here. Could I ask whether you, where, where you compare the home team and the away team uh, mm -hmm. with big crowds, whether if, in fact the difference may be attributable to the fact that the uh, away team are generally defending a lot more. They're under a lot of pressure. They expect mm -hmm. the, a, a home team to attack a lot more. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they're likely to be a bit more desperate uh, to try and stop the attacking team, which therefore will lead to more fouls and more cautions. Is it's, that not yeah. a, another explanation? It's, it's, yeah, it's a great point, Richard. First of all, thanks, thanks for your question and, uh, and, and thanks for attending tonight. Um, so when we look at psychological research and what I didn't want to do in the book is kind of make it bog people down too much in this. They run what's called a statistical analysis. And when we do a statistical analysis, there's many different ways of looking at it. And one particular area that a lot of psychologists will use is what's called a regression analysis. So what they'll do is they'll take lots and lots of data. So they'll look at like possession stats, for example. Now, the reason possession stats are quite important is because they know who has the ball and who hasn't. And if you have the ball, you're not going to commit any fouls. If you don't, you're more likely to commit fouls. What you can do is you can look at the possession stats and enter them into the same game. So you'd put the away team had, say, 30% and they had six yellow cards. What you would then do is when you come to analyze the statistics, you include that data, but then you run what's called a regression. So although you've included that data, you ask the machine to run those stats and exclude that one aspect. And you do that for every factor. So you do that for possession. You do that for shots on target. You do that for previous yellow cards. You do that for time added on. You do that for previous games of that particular team. And then you see if that result is still significant. 
If it's not significant, we know that those other things have affected it. If it is significant, we know that it says just that it's a significant bearing. Those results are still significant. And I do say this in the book, even when things such as possession are taken into consideration, score line are taken, is taken into consideration, playing styles taken into consideration. That does not mean your point's not valid, because of course there's never one attributable cause to something like this. So you're absolutely right. Yes, playing style and away, uh, you know, the away team may, may be more happy with the draw and therefore start to defend a 1-0 lead earlier than a home team would. Yes, all that has a massive effect. But what we do know is that when you start to remove crowd noise, it has an impact. The best example I can give to you, Richard, is we set referees up um, in a room and they were asked to watch a game. And I, I just know the game happened to be a game between Liverpool and Leicester City. And... The game was at Anfield and half the referees watched it with crowd noise and half of them watched it without. So we know by doing it in a lab like that, you can eliminate all other um, distractions. So, oh, the, you know, the I want to be seen favourably or, you know, I know the coach, something like that. The, the group of referees that watched it with crowd noise not only awarded Liverpool more free kicks, but they showed Leicester City uh -huh. more yellow cards. And the group that watched it with no crowd noise, it wasn't even equal. They actually gave Leicester more free kicks. They actually felt Leicester were the, you know, sort of the, the more fouled team in this particular game. And, and that's how we get around influence of that. So I'm not saying that it's nothing to take, uh, not right to take that in consideration, because it is, but um, it's something that we can account for in these analyses. Uh, the other question, which is about uh... Uh, young referees or newly qualified referees, which is that um, they have no assistants except mm -hmm. club linesmen. Uh, they probably go up there on their own. It may be their mum or dad might take them, uh, but they have no, as it were, refereeing buddy with them. Yeah. If they do have a buddy, that's a bonus. And it seems to me um, the key to a referee succeeding is confidence. Mm -hmm. and, and it must be really tr difficult even for us you know I've been refereeing for far too long but you still need confidence uh, and uh, when you're on your own you you need that um, you need a good regular supply of games where you do well to build up your confidence yep. and I think it's the isolation of the referee that I find is the worrying feature um, because no one loves you on a football pitch. Um, they start with a neutral view of you, but at the end of the day, you're not a man to be loved. And, um, you know, you, you need your confidence boosting. You, you're absolutely right, Richard. Um, the two sort of areas or, or points I maybe sort of like build upon there is that loneliness, believe it or not, um, doesn't go away from what I'm re uh, understanding from interviewing some elite level referees. Um, for example, one guy told me that if he makes a mistake, he said the drive home is <laughs> the lowest moment in his life. And he's like, you know, at his level, he knows if he's made a mistake or had a bad game. So he's saying that's that's really difficult for him to cope with. So maybe one area, and the reason I'm doing these interviews is to try to look at avenues for research moving forward in this area is when do referees actually need support and guidance? Is it before, during or after the game or all three? So loneliness is always there. And the word lonely comes up a lot when I talk to these guys. Um, the second thing is this lack of support. So I asked one guy, I said, why is it, you know, if, if a you know big football player, you know, Harry Kane or Lionel Messi or Ronaldo or someone like that, they can miss a penalty. They can miss an open goal. They can misplace an easy pass. And the crowd don't get on their back. They just carry on supporting them. And I talk about this in the book. It's called idiosyncrasy credit. It's like you've got enough credit in the bank. Like, you know, you do such a good job. We'll forgive you for this mistake. So, but referees could do, they can have 88 minutes of being perfect. And then if you make a mistake in the 89th minute or the 90th minute, you're going to be spoken about afterwards for a long time. And, and that's the only thing they're going to remember. Um, one uh, professional referee put it to me like this. He said, one game for a referee is a season for a player. A player has a season to prove themselves. We have a game to prove ourselves. He said, like, you can maybe make one mistake and they'll forgive that. But if you have a bad game, he's like, that's it. You're off a World Cup list. You're off a cup final, things like that. So you're absolutely right. How do you cope with that? 
you got to be or treat a person and it's actually the area of research i'm looking at right now is rather than maybe looking at uh, how you can train better attentional skills or focus skills it's about how can you help people become more resilient cheers richard Stuart, richard touched on there and you you touched there about the um loneliness in the car driving home mm -hmm. sometimes at games you're in a car late at night you may have had an indifferent game and you you self-analyze your game to an nth degree and you actually told to self-analyze your game at the higher level yeah. to try and make the better the wrongs that you've done um the other thing is that officials tend to worry about is injuries whilst they're driving home because you're static and you know you, you lactic acids are building up and it's a one way of late in the evenings after a game like that and you've just not properly cooled down as soon as you finish the game you're in the boardroom there's pressure on you they did teach us certain exercises to do in the um changing room prior to going into the boardroom but in some cases you've got a good two two and a half hour drive and you get home late you've got to get early for the work the next day and you've got to have a good work balance with football um mm -hmm. uh, and not put all the emphasis on one or the other because at the levels that level threes and fours is such a big demand for little reward mm -hmm. uh, monetary wise and it's a big commitment and fair play to every level four three and two on their way up some might not make it but it's a big commitment and you don't know um, what your end goal is going to be but in sort of summarizing there's a lot of commitment going out there and sometimes the referees some deal with it much better psychologically than mm -hmm. others yep yeah, you're absolutely right so some people will deal with things uh, more effectively the reason i say I'm, I'm worried about saying oh they deal with it better is because everyone's a human being and we all deal with things in different ways um and we all have triggers we all have buttons that get pressed and we can also be we can cope with some things very well one day and then for another reason cope with it very poorly the following week so we're human beings and we all experience that um, one area of the model that i talk about is rational thinking one thing i've learned is that referees are really really good at rationalizing other people's behaviors and also rationalizing mistakes and that's fine there's no problem with that however what it doesn't do is it doesn't address some of the issues that you just spoke about there it's like coping resilience so in the book i talk about the importance of rational thinking which is actually if someone calls me uh, I won't say the words, but you can imagine the sort of things that a referee will get called. If someone calls me that and it doesn't make me feel great, I might rationalise that behaviour by saying, well, they were just angry at the time. They don't really mean it. Rational thinking is actually saying, what if I am a so-and-so? Why does that matter? Why does it matter if somebody thinks I'm useless? It's just an opinion of someone else. One thing that I get time and time again from talking to, from, uh, with professional referees is they're saying, my identity is not solely as a referee. So these are professional officials. And they say, just because I'm a referee doesn't mean that's all I am. I'm a father, I'm a brother, I'm a son, daughter, sister, mother, whatever it is. I enjoy these things, I enjoy those things as well. In the book, one thing I talk about is the importance of motivation, but I also talk about the importance of passion and a, a very prominent French psychologist, uh, French Canadian psychologist, sorry, talks about the importance of passion. And there's obsessive passion when you feel you have to do the activity, so like you're almost addicted to it. And then there's one way you enjoy doing the activity. And we know that there are massive, massive psychological and behavioral consequences, depending on what type of passion you have. My advice for the referees that uh, maybe take that criticism to heart and also that criticism has a very negative effect on their well-being and emotions is actually you know you, yes you are a referee but that is not all you are and actually practice and exercise other uh, activities or uh, livelihood not livelihoods uh, pastimes that you may enjoy okay anyone got anything else time to speak Okay, so I want to say is, Stuart, thanks very much for tonight. Um, so it's been a, been a really interesting session, that one. Um, we'll be going back onto our website, um, so people will be able to view it again uh, in the future. Um, 
but just thanks for so much, Stuart. As I said, it's been really, really informative, really useful. Thank you very much for having me, everyone. I really appreciate your interest. And uh, please feel free to, if you, people do have any questions or anything like that at all, um, Chris, if you email Chris, uh, please feel free to pass over email details and, and answer them via that way, which has happened in the past.